Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am Marcelo Moscatelli. Uh, I work at Ledger as a sales director, as Veronique mentioned before. I have been working in the crypto space for the last um, five years, five, six years. I worked at uh, crypto exchanges, crypto.com, and then I joined Ledger one year ago, and I am working here in the B2B side of the business at Ledger. Uh, Ledger is a French company, French unicorn that is uh, mostly focused on, let's say, uh, the purpose is financial freedom and self sovereignty. But we do uh, our what is we do hardware wallets, and on the B two B side, uh, we create infrastructure for companies to secure their assets. So here I'm gonna talk mainly. I'm gonna talk to you mainly about uh, how a company secure and can manage their assets securely when it comes to digital assets and Web3. And yeah, that's the main objective of, a, of the talk. Um, so Great, so basically I divided the presentation in five points. Uh, I will give you a, kick over, a quick overview on TradFi uh, and the differences between traditional finance and decentralized finance. Then uh, I'm going to talk to you about the crypto and the DeFi expansion and growth, uh, mainly since pandemic, let's say. And then uh, which are the risks associated with Web3 operations, or if you are a company, uh, which are the, mo the most important topics to take into account when we manage uh, crypto assets and digital assets. And then uh, a crypto custody landscape, uh, what's the crypto custody landscape look like at the moment for, for institutions and for cor corporates. And then a differentiation between custodians and pure tech company, which is what Ledger does. Um, so yeah, I will give you also uh, the main differences between uh, a custodian and a pure tech company where you become the custodian or the company becomes the, the custodian. So as Marianne was pointing before, uh, basically the main difference here uh, within TradFi and DeFi, DeFi and crypto and blockchain was uh, created and was always meant to be peer-to-peer. -peer. So a decentralized platform, no censorship for people, everyone can interact and we can interact directly. And the blockchains are created in a way that they are uh, I mean, you don't have to trust, uh, so they are trustless in order to transact. Whereas in traditional finance, we have these uh, central authorities or central third parties, such as a central bank, uh, the SEC or Securities and Exchange Commission. We have clearing houses. We have different players that are in between uh, all the players that are into the market. So. But every everyone, investors, lenders, every institution or a borrower will come together into this central authority and the central authority will take care of the sanity and the health of the market and the system. In DeFi, uh, we don't have such, uh, such authority. So that is why here, uh, the security, every transaction that we are doing on a blockchain, we don't have a path back to recover our assets. So if I am sending my assets proactively, then I, I can't get my assets back if I am making a mistake. So that is why here we can see different uh, actors and players such as investors, lenders, AMMs, uh, decentralized exchanges, yield farming protocols, and all of them you are just interacting uh, with the other person. And let's say the regulator is the, is the code or the protocol. So you have to stake, uh, you have to stick to the to the protocol, understand the complexity, understand everything of what you are doing just before uh, jumping into crypto. Here is um, so this is a figure about uh, the growth of total value locked. Um, total value locked can mean different things um, re depending on the protocol uh, and depending on the, the activity that we are doing. Uh, so for example, Marianne, 
just mentioned um, crypto collateralized stable currencies in differentiation with uh, algorithmic stable currencies. So MakerDAO is uh, it's the, the DAO or the decentralized autonomous organization who created uh, DAI, which is a crypto collateralized stable currency. What, what does that mean? Uh, that basically means that every DAI who Print who prints die print uh, sorry die is printed by the users. So every time that you want to get a loan, let's say you can go to the MakerDAO protocol and you can lock your Ethereum's, for example. And against your Ethereum's, you will get some die. So the Ethereum is the collateral. The Ethereum is the the warrant that you are providing to the protocol. And you print the dice at a, let's say, depending on the volatility, uh, on the observed volatility of Ethereum, you will print, let's say, 50%, 40% worth of die. And then when you get back your dice to the protocol, uh, those Ethereums will get unlocked. But basically, the total value locked in that case is basically you are locking Ethereum or ERC20 tokens that can be other assets. Um, Ex existing on the Ethereum blockchain just to get DAI. In a decentralized exchange, for example, uh, what the total value locked means is basically people who are providing liquidity to different pairs. So if we, if we want to trade, let's say, BTC against USDT in Uniswap, which is the, the, the largest decentralized exchange at the moment, people are providing liquidity to that protocol and to that specific pair. So people are locking their Bitcoins and their USDT in order to provide liquidity to that pair. So people can have liquidity, can have volume and can have market depth in a decentralized exchange. So this is a total value locked. And again, I want to move, I cannot see my, okay. Um, I can see the figure because I don't have the mouse, but no worries. Uh, the idea here is that just to show you, we, we had two ATH or all time, all time hikes in the crypto space in the last year, it was May and then November. Uh, in November, uh, Bitcoin reached uh, 68K uh, per Bitcoin. And basically the idea was to show you that in June uh, 2020, um, basically the total value locked uh, was 1 billion, whereas now is basically $56 billion. Um, so it grows 55X in, in just a matter of two years. And that's the, the, the growth of, of DeFi. At the same time, uh, we can see also the growth in centralized exchanges. Uh, there is a huge concentration with with Binance at the moment. So Binance accounts or Binance volume uh, accounts for 70% of the total uh, volume in centralized exchanges, which is huge. So this again, demonstrates that people at some point uh, like centralization and like to have someone to trust uh, and to have credibility on someone. So this is a case of Binance. So again, um, Regardless of the VR market at this point, at this moment, Bitcoin trading at uh, 19K per Bitcoin, we still see the growth, uh, that the growth is, is constant and it is still growing. Uh, and if you compare again, like the volume July, 2022 against the volume in uh, 2020, it's again like 50X what uh, the volume was back then. Here, um, on the contrary, uh, I think that the centralized exchanges, and this is my opinion and my take, uh, are losing a bit of um, traction because I, I see three main points this year uh, so far uh, in, in DeFi and in crypto. And I have like three milestones that are the first one, uh, the, two, the Terra and Luna crisis with, with UST getting depecked. So UST was, for those that don't know, uh, UST was a partially algorithmic stable currency and partially also BTC uh, backed uh, stable currency. So the thing was that uh, the, 
the, the protocol couldn't uh, afford uh, the, the outflows from UST, UST get depecked, and that caused a huge crisis on, on different protocols, uh, like such as Curve, uh, such as uh, Compound and many others. But the main problem here is that uh, that algorithmic uh, stable currency didn't work. Uh, du Quan, who was the founder, had to sell uh, around $2.5 billion worth of Bitcoin in the market that cost, again, huge pressure to, to the Bitcoin to, to, to go down. And basically, that was the first crisis. At the same time, USDT, USDT is um, broadcasted by Bitfinex. Uh, so at that moment, also, it, uh, it started to, to get depecked. So that was a kind of a credibility crisis. Uh, on DeFi and crypto, that was the first event. The second event was the lending or lenders crisis. We saw both Celsius and Voyager Digital filling up uh, for bankruptcy in the US. And there is still some other lenders that can suffer from that, uh, from that impact. Uh, and the third milestone, uh, and this is probably a bull bullish uh, milestone, was the merge. Uh, so around... Uh, 20 days ago or 15 days ago, we had the merge on Ethereum transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and that happened smoothly. Uh, the network is working. And now again, like people are wondering about the decentralization because like there are six or five, six um, players that are concentrating all the, the, the staking and the, the validation power at the moment. Uh, so basically that affected, uh, on my opinion, that affected the centralized exchanges and that affected DeFi a little bit, uh, but still. So uh, just going into uh, my specific topic, let's say um, I wanted to show you and I wanted to tell you more about the risks associated with crypto operations, Web3, um, and again, blockchain. Uh, when it comes to secure your assets to manage, your assets at, at an enterprise or at, at an institutional level, let's say. So the five points again that I see here are, as they are expressed in the in the slide, internal mis mismanagement. So it's mandatory, let's say, if you are dealing with crypto assets and managing crypto assets at your organization to have crypto savvy people. Otherwise you can suffer from mismanagement and again, here you don't have a central authority to go uh, and to claim or sue or whatever. So internal mismanagement is a huge problem uh, in crypto companies, protecting your digital identity from scratch and doing things uh, in a proper way from scratch. Then uh, of course you can suffer as well from internal collusion and fraud. Uh, that's probably the main risk uh, with crypto companies, both crypto native and non crypto native companies, but that are um, holding crypto. That's a huge problem. So governance is really important. Compliance is really important. And then external hacks. Of course, you're dealing with a new technology that has only 10 years uh, in the market. So external actors, bad actors are and there is a huge scale of, um, of value. So at the moment, there are many bad actors and hackers trying to, to find breaches in order to, to exploit some protocols or exploit your wallet or uh, whatever you're doing in crypto. Then just another risk is just to be uh, regulatory non-compliance and you know, suffer from sanctions in the future. Uh, so you have to look at the regulations, Mika coming in now, the AMF in France or whatever you're based, wherever your jurisdiction is and the customers you're dealing with, that's another key uh, topic. And then the last one is key like tech inefficiencies. If you have a setup that is, or infrastructure that is not, not well prepared for your activities or operations, then you can suffer again, uh, from downtimes or many things that can affect your normal operations and that can have, of course, an impact uh, in, in value and in money. The crypto custody landscape for institutions at the moment. Um, 
So when you are a company, what should you be taking into account? Uh, so the first main debate or thing that you have to, to look at and to decide and to take a decision is basically whereas you want to do self-custody, because again, this is a technology that allows you to own your, your own assets, uh, or you will go with a custodian, or you will go with a custodian that can be an exchange, that can be a um, regulated or qualified custodian in whatever jurisdiction, but that's basically something that you have to look at from the beginning, and that's the first question that you have to, to uh, ask to yourself. Then the second one is um, if you, because of your organization, because of regulations, and because of the law, basically, you should go with regulated or a non-regulated custodian or non-regulated vendor is enough for you. Another one is the technical know-how that you need. So again, if you are doing self-custody or if you are also using a custodian, at the end of the day, you will need crypto know-how or crypto savvy people uh, in your organization to deal uh, in a day-to-day -day basis with crypto activities. And then uh, these are probably externalities or things that come after or extra layers from the initial setup is whereas you will need fiat on and off ramped services. So cash in and cash out, uh, depending on the jurisdiction on in which you are. Uh, so this is also a key topic and then extra layer, just you have send, receive, and a store. In the beginning, that's the basic layer, zero layer. And then you can add crypto trading, lending, yield farming, or automated market makers, uh, staking, and then NFT capabilities as well. So at the moment, there are around um, 300 active crypto custodians in the world. That can be exchanges, banks, qualified custodians, or institutional qualified custodians. That can be hedge funds, funds. So three com uh, 300 uh, active uh, companies that are holding crypto on behalf of other people. Uh, within those, we have the B2B and the B2C. And this is a very um, broad differentiation because there are, there are many more complexities when you, st when you start to dig into. Uh, but basically, the B2B is basically institutional players uh, who don't have any end user uh, as a customer, end users or individuals as a customer. So here we have BitGo, Coinbase Institutional. So Coinbase have... Coinbase has its, uh, of course, retail product. It's an exchange. End users and individuals can interact with Coinbase and can have an account in Coinbase, but also Coinbase has its institutional side um, and its institutional business. Then Ledger Enterprise is another one. Uh, and here I'm not differentiating between uh, pure tech or custodians. So we have Coinbase, which is a custodian they are taking care of your keys and your master seed and at the end of the day they are uh, you are delegating the master seed and they are the real owners of your assets and then ledger enterprise is a pure tech player uh they are around they are they account for um 100 billion auc uh, at the moment assets under custody which is basically around 10 percent of the total crypto market cap and then the b2c players are mostly exchanges or crypto apps, and they are accounting for 7% of the total crypto uh, market capitalization. Of course, again, like here, there are different solutions, pure tech or custodians that will fit you, whatever, like depending on the activity that you want to do. Some of the, um, of the, players at the moment are this. So again, we have retail custody providers, uh, we have institutional uh, services such as um, Gemini, Binance, Coinbase, Coinhouse in France. And those are going towards and are moving towards a prime brokerage, a prime brokerage uh, fashion. So there you have not only custody, but also trading, 
fiat on and off ramp settlements you have liquidity um and you have many other things many other services and they are trying to be a one-stop shop uh that again when once you become a one-stop shop in crypto you can't handle all the things by your own in your own so coinhouse or gemini uh coinhouse is a client of ledger if you enter into the coinhouse uh website you will see that they are using ledger as part of their infrastructure they are using a bank account they are using different market makers for the liquidity and volume on their exchange so a one-stop shop uh needs many different providers to to join the, the the business then you have custody tech providers that are metaco torus uh copper ledger enterprise uh credo and those are pure tech companies those uh don't have any assets under management and they are just providing infrastructure and services uh and tech for the custodians so none of them will get regulated the ledger doesn't have the need to get regulated in the future because we do not manage crypto assets we provide the technology uh to people uh to, for them to for them to manage their own assets on this side uh the the pure tech providers there are many different um kind of technologies and like approaches you can have hsm which means hardware security model and at the same time you can have multi-party computation or or sharing um or shamir's shamir secret sharing so many different technologies that are out there to serve uh the different institutional clients um and this is it on this so Custodians, uh, again, I will dig into custodian and what a custodian is bringing, bringing to their clients uh, at the moment. So basically qualified custodians provide mostly um, speciality in regulations and expertise in regulations. They provide the legal framework for companies to be comfortable managing digital assets. Uh, so I can name Tetra, Tetra Trust uh, in Canada. They are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission in Canada. Uh, here, the case of Coinhouse or in the UK, Comainu. So there are, there are different um, qualified custodians that the main objective is to provide uh, a legal framework and compliance to their clients. They like most of the time they use and they utilize like different vendors for risk diversification so they not only use copper or metaco as a pure tech but they are also using fireblocks ledger and they have to have many different uh um infrastructure providers in order to to diversify risks they're, they have, as I mentioned before, a prime brokerage approach. So they are aggregating different offerings like such as exchange connectivity, uh, connectivity to trading desks or OTC trading desks. They have partnerships with staking providers so they can provide you with staking in different companies such as Figment, Block Demon, or Kiln. Uh, so they have a this aggregated offering to provide their clients with and also they provide this uh governance framework when you are working with a custodian you do not own your master seed you do not own your private keys so uh, all the things that you have to to take into account is how the custodian is uh like designing your governance framework and you can also work with the custodian to design your governance framework if you need uh, different approvals if you have a white list so basically you can only transact or send money or funds out of your account to a certain uh, address so you can create your governance framework but at the end is a custodian who is in charge of creating this um, this governance engine for you the pure tech solutions on the contrary uh, they provide you with the tech stack and with the tech infrastructure for you to create and design your own governance framework. So with Ledger, we provide infrastructure, we provide technology, 
and our customer, our governance engine or our governance framework is fully customizable. So you can create whatever you want. You can create uh, approval steps. Uh, you can create whitelists. You can create different users. You can um, create amount thresholds as well. So for this Bitcoin account, I can only transact up to five Bitcoin. And if I want to transact over five Bitcoin, I will need the approval of the chief compliance officer of the company. So this is fully customi customizable governance engine. Most of the time, they also provide uh, a pool crime insurance policy, let's say, uh, that allows their clients to create a dedicated top up in their account if needed. So, and that ba this basically means uh, the most important part of this is that our solution or the solution of another pure tech provider is trusted and it has been audited by the, the, the underwriters of the policy of the insurance policy. So it's like the beginning, the layer zero again, and then from there, your clients can create a top up for your account. What I'm trying to say is that normally these insurance policies cannot cover the whole AUM or the whole assets under management that are and in that platform, it's just a trademark that the, the solution is uh, trusted and it has been audited by a uh, underwriter and by a broker. Uh, and then from there, you can create a dedicated top up, top up for your specific accounts. These solutions can be on and off premise as well. Um, on premise, I mean, just having the services in your company and the, comp and the, the pure tech provider uh, the custody tech provider is building everything uh, in place. Um, so basically on-premise at your at the organization. And then the second one is just accessing, accessing HSMs or a data center remotely, uh, remotely. And basically the, the HSMs and the secure data centers are hosted by the, the provider. And then again, DeFi and NFTs enablement. So in these platforms, you can, since, since you are the owner of the assets, you can transact in DeFi and you can, um, you can basically put your assets in a lending protocol, you can borrow, you can uh, access to a decentralized exchange. So these companies are again creating a, frame, a secure framework for you to interact with, with DeFi protocols. And again, last slide. Uh, so again, just coming back to the initial point, which are the, the key um, things to, to make a decision, uh, whereas you go with a, a custodian or whereas you go with a pure tech provider. First is um, the regulatory framework uh, and the coming regulations as well, because here we can focus on the, the IMF uh, rules and laws, but then Mika will, Will come uh, and will come into into play in, in in the whole in Europe. So basically, that's very important. Uh, the second part is just if you have the right people and if you have the crypto savvy people to manage uh, your assets uh, and also to manage self custody, or if you need certain advice and someone to be creating this governance framework for you. Uh, also, you have to consider the different. Um, a service, this, the different services that you will need in the future. Whereas you need a fiat on and off ramp, or if you need a staking, or if you need lending, or if you will need to take a loan in the future. So these are things to take into account uh, in order to choose your, your right provider and your right fit. And then the last one is need for financial or crypto advice. A PR tech will not provide you with any advice because uh, we are not a financial company. And if you want to go with a financial company, you better go with a custodian that are um, sort of a prime brokerage. So yeah, that's basically it on my side. Uh, I hope it's it's clear. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to <laughs> ask. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marcelo. Uh, do you have questions? Is there a question? 
Yes, I have a question, if I may. Yes, yes, come on. Marcelo, if you don't mind sharing, what is your um, crypto portfolio? If you have one, I'm pretty sure you're, you you could have one, but like, what is it? If you could mention, like, not in the numbers, but like the coins you have invested in right now, currently. Um. Yeah. Of course, I I, I am into Bitcoin because Bitcoin was the first um, the first and the the token and the crypto that I that I first knew in order to, to enter into the space. Uh, and I trust this uh, decentralized and private uh, monetary system. Uh, I see inflations that, uh, both in the US uh, and Europe and Japan, basically that are, that will be out of control. So of course, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum as well. I, I, I like the, the way the merge uh, went very, very, smoothly and everything is all right and i think uh in the future we will not have this problem of decentralization or not which is the main question now in in with, with ethereum and then of course like i like paul carrot i like the the way the parachains uh work and the different uh layers that you can have in paul carrot i mean i have paul carrot solana and different different altcoins as well but mainly uh bitcoin and ethereum thank you is there another question yeah yeah i also have another okay. question okay. marcelo it's uh, it's, uh yeah it's uh, uh it's about uh, traditional finance and uh defi so you mentioned that there's uh defi and uh, traditional uh financial crypto which uh are not not decentralized and like is uh like what is the point of uh tradfi if basically crypto was supposed to be defi like for instance we have crypto assets like xrp which are not decentralized which are centralized on uh company ripple as you know, and what is the point of uh, crypto coins like this if they're not decentralized? Well, at the end, it's providing a new technology. Um, I mean, we, we can discuss what we understand by decentralization, but basically Ripple or XRP is a permission blockchain. So yeah, you have, you need the, the admission from someone else in order to play. Uh, so. I mean, I am mostly focused on decentralized and censorship resistant blockchains more than um, permission blockchains. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. Another question? No other question at the moment. Um, I have uh, uh, two small questions, uh, Marcelo. Yes. Uh, first question, since Ledger has an international activity, have you seen any difference uh, between countries, I mean, between markets or countries relating to uh, uh, to uh, DeFi, to uh, crypto assets? Very, very interesting <laughs> question. So now we are seeing a huge rise in the US markets uh, and in the Americas, uh, basically because of the fact that they are there are some mayors leading the, the crypto activity and basically embracing crypto on Web3, such as the mayor of New York, uh, Miami, and some other states. So we see that they are, uh, they, they are more crypto friendly. So every time there is a government that is more crypto friendly, we have seen this same uh, in, the, in the UAE as well. So every time we see a government that is more crypto friendly, the crypto companies immediately move there because they mm -hmm. are easy to move at some point. They are working remotely, so they have way much ease to move than a normal company. So yeah, the US at the moment, uh, APAC remains pretty pretty uh, retail at the moment, but APAC will, will gain a lot of traction. And here we have to see with Mika, that's uncertainty at the moment. Okay. And um, another question, since you have decentralized finance, um, I would like to know if there is a significant impact or change in, uh, you know, what we call uh, agency costs and transaction costs. <clears throat> Can you repeat that? Uh, well, you know, you have uh, costs which are related to operations we do on the market. So uh, have you, uh, well, 
while I'm yeah, sure. we'll get to about agency and transaction costs, but have you a, a significant impact on the costs? Yeah, sure. On, uh, on the, yes. They, there, are, there are many EVM compatible chains that are an alternative uh, to Ethereum. EVM uh, means uh, Ethereum virtual machine compatible chains. So basically, it's the same uh, sort of code and they are sharing many things. You can also have the same address to deal with, with those. The principal objective of the merge, besides the, the energy consumption that we can discuss, whereas Bitcoin is, uh, you know, um, bad for the environment or not, sometimes, and some crypto, some crypto miners are being established. I'm sorry, I'm going very broad, but basically coming back to the, to the initial point, yeah, Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchains sometimes get con congestioned and that, that causes uh, high fees or high gas fees. With the merge, but there is a huge misconception. With the merge only, uh, we are not have we are not going to have a an immediate impact on gas fees. There are many other steps that the Ethereum blockchain and the Ethereum Foundation needs to to take in order to reduce to reduce gas fees, uh, but it will not be immediately and then if you want like cheaper blockchains with probably less secure or less security or less decentralization you can try some others but yeah ethereum gas gas prices sometimes are are very high okay, okay. thank you thank you marcelo uh, another question before we finish or is it fine for everybody yes i do have a question <laughs> yes uh, so, Marcelo, uh, could you please share your insights on the one-stop shop that you mentioned on your last slide, uh, on your last slide? Like, what do you see the future of them? The, um, do, uh, with the emergence or even dominance of those custodies uh, exchanges, will it be some sort of like a de decentralization? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. At Ledger, we have the Ledger Nanos, which, which is basically the most sold hardware wallet in the industry. And with the hardware wallet, in order to use your, your hardware wallet, you need the Ledger Life, which is um, um, the complement, uh, both it could be in your laptop or in your phone. Uh, so basically, the the Ledger Live is a one-stop shop, and there we are integrating different protocols, different exchanges such as Changely, Paraswap. We are integrating Aave, MakerDAO, different protocols for different purposes, and we are integrating not only the centralized protocols but also some centralized um, players, for example, Coinhouse in France, or um, many others like OpenSea. Um, so basically, they are uh, for centralized players. You need to do a KYC with the with the player, and of course, it depends whether you are having whether you will have the possibility to interact with a centralized uh, or not, based on where you are, because based on your jurisdiction. So that's the one stop shop that we have at Ledger. Uh, I think that um, that's major and that's huge. Uh, and then uh, again, like. Uh, you you need to to take the best out of many players uh, in order to create this one stop shop. And in my opinion, you need to be open. Ledger uh, developers .ledger .com, their developers can start you know integrating their solutions in our um, in our stack and in our Ledger Live uh, for in, for the future. So again, like open source solutions are the best in my opinion. And I think that decentralization and just uh, this way of doing things will, will thrive in the future. So that's my, my opinion. Okay, thank you. Another question, no? No other question? So uh, we are going to, to, to conclude now. Uh, we thank, uh, we need to thank everybody for attending this uh, webinar and thank you, uh, Marcelo and thank you, thank you, Marianne. Uh, the, the topic is very interesting and, uh, I, I have a lot of questions, but we, we overlap. <laughs> so I shall ask you after the, the webinar. 
uh, and we were very happy to to have uh, all our participants and to uh, welcome you online for this crypto asset uh, webinar. Thank you and uh, have a nice day.